What do you think of this image? Pretentious, arrogant, entitled, young, difficult to like. Well, that image is me. And that image almost destroyed my reputation. Let me take you back. It's summer 2022. I'm a CEO of a talent agency, and we just made it on the Times fastest growing companies list. A group of people we used to work with threatens us to start a hate campaign, unless we wire them half a million pounds. We, of course, do not wire the amount, but then they put their plan to action. When the cyberbullying campaign begins, I am pregnant, and amongst the thousands of attacks, here are some of the ones that I can read daily. I hope you die. I hope you get raped. I hope you lose a baby. It was horrible. I felt sick. I felt vulnerable, and I felt really, really scared. Scared for my business. For my family, for my friends, and for my baby, and I think that's pretty frightening. You see, I post regularly on social media. I have hundreds of professional pictures from more recent days you could have chosen. So why this one? This picture was taken in Los Angeles at a time I had been asked to look sexy, more womanly, more posy. I was quite uncomfortable. It really wasn't myself, but I was 23, and you just do what you're told. And that picture was then uploaded onto Getty Images. It's actually something that I will go and challenge later on when I built my own business, so that I could represent myself for my own visual terms, because of the biases it captured of female leaders. A group of researchers from both universities of Washington and Colorado were gathered, and they asked participants to rank images of women. If you were a young woman in the entertainment world, you'd be likely to do quite well. If you were a young woman in the business world, well, that was quite unfortunate. You'd be more likely to be disliked, distrusted, and more likely to be fired. And that's because last year, only one percent of funding. Went to businesses funded solely by women. And psychologically, we have a bit of dislike, a bit of distrust towards what we do not know. It's also important to understand the context of where an image is being published. As I mentioned, this image was captured in the USA. I live in London. I run a British company. This was published in France. You may be aware that the France has a long tradition to dislike all things American. In fact, in the 1950s, President Charles de Gaulle declared, "I will build an amazing civilization away from the American model." You might also not be aware that, according to the recent PISA study, France is the worst-performing country when it comes to social mobility in Europe, with two parents as primary teachers not coming from wealth. I am a very unlikely visual representation of someone that will be leading a fast-growing global business. Now, I'm at a stage in my life when I'm incredibly privileged and so fortunate, and I have such a strong group of people supporting me. But this opened my eyes to the people that will be constantly targeted by visual prejudices, who might not be able to get past this experience. So I use my expertise. As a business person, but also an author in the visual sector, and I started to read. I read about his, the history of prejudices, the history of perception, the history of social neuroscience that explain why do we struggle so much with people that we don't see that often. And that's how I discovered that on a daily basis we were confronted by five most common visual prejudices. Number one. Of racial visual prejudices, I could have chosen thousands, if not millions, of images to illustrate this prejudice. But this movie genre, the black exploitation, really shocked me. It was financed by the white power structure of Hollywood in the 1970s, and it depicted black men as criminal, sexually abusive, using drugs. Think of timing. 
That is only a couple of years after Martin Luther King got assassinated and there's still tons of racial crimes on the ground. And as you're looking at those images, you might be horrified, but you might be thinking, well, at least this is in the past. Unfortunately not. That's a recent image. And to this day, the Murdoch newspaper that publishes the image of Serena Williams still hasn't apologized to her. Number two are religious visual prejudices. I wanted to illustrate the lack of evolution when it comes to religious visual prejudices. By putting those two images are a hundred years apart. On the left, the Third Reich. On the right, this was used by a European party recently, not even an extreme one. And of course, it's not just targeting Jewish people. That's an image depicting all Qatari players as terrorists from the World Cup in 2022, broadcasted by several media, including liberal ones. And yet we know that religious visual prejudices are the fuel to current global conflicts. Number three, gender visual prejudices. I shared with you earlier my story, but I wanted to give you a number. 1.8 million women were killed, actually more than that, burned alive because they were believed to be witches in the Middle Ages. But the idea of a witch is still very much around us. Is that woman nice? Is she taking a bit too much space? Is she a bit too powerful? Does that remind you of someone? Number four, ageism visual prejudices. A recent report by The Guardian newspaper published that we lived in a society that pitied and disliked the eldest. And that's because on a daily basis, we only see images of them looking mentally inferior or physically weak, which of course results in having a terrible impact on their mental health. Number five, social economical prejudices. And for this one, I want you to imagine how would you depict a homeless person in your mind? Would you be thinking of one of those images of someone sleeping rough? I did. But that's actually one of the most accepted visual bias in our society. Only 1% of homelessness sleeps rough on the street. Most of the images we see concentrates on them and what's wrong about them or what's incredibly strong about them. In fact, it's been reported that several media refuse to publicize images that do not reinforce the stereotypes. The more we dehumanize them, the less we support them. But the good news is that artists are changing that. And what's really interesting with images is, as we said earlier, we are digesting 10,000 images a day. 10,000. They travel super fast to our brain, and as such, they reach the amygdala, the most primitive part of our brain, our fight-and-flight response. So we act on affect. We don't have time to analyze them. We get so overwhelmed that therefore we lean in towards the simplified stories of them. So let me show you, therefore, how artists are able to shift those perceptions. The first example is artist Delphine Diallo. She spent the last 20 years redefining how women are portrayed in society, beyond objectification. We had to battle hard to convince the city, many councils, to incorporate 50 meters of that visual representation right in the heart of London, and actually more than that, right in the heart of one of the most commercial streets of London, Regent Street. If it wasn't for this 50 meters of visual representation, you would normally see a casual advert with a young model advertising underwears or clothes. And that was usually successful. With this, people realized what they were missing. They ultimately realized how empowering that statement was. The second example is artist Derek Obertang. He's Ghanaian. When you Google his country, that's all you see. Pictures of war, poverty, and destruction. He wanted to change that. So he started to capture people around him with joy and their rich cultural heritage. 
the images behind me, they went viral. What this artist shows us is that we can challenge visual biases. Like them, we can start to question, not just look. We can start to participate, not just consume visually. Our visual world is a democratic space. And as such, we all have a duty to get involved. And there's a very specific timing to my talk, because we've been discussing at length recently the rise of artificial intelligence. But current AI models are being trained using visual biases. If we believe that by 2050, 75% of the images we're going to look at will be generated by AI, well, that means those visual biases are about to be really amplified. So let's just do a quick test, shall we? If we ask two of the main AI models, MidJourney, OpenAI, who is a strong person in our society? Well, I only get images of body-built men. Not a single man with three kids, not trying to try, someone trying to cross over to his or her country to save his or her life. If I ask OpenAI or MidJourney, who is a caring person. Now, for all the men in the room, there's no pictures of you. It's just women. And wait, because we may be going full circle. If I ask OpenAI or MidJourney, who is a CEO? Well, I'm not included. So how do we shift this in our daily lives? You don't need to be a CEO. You don't need to be working with artists. You could be pulling together a marketing presentation and having to choose images for it. Are you going to select images that reinforce visual biases or challenge them? When you scroll online, which images are you going to click on? The one that reinforces visual biases or the one that challenges them? When you walk around your city, can you start paying attention to all the missing visual representation? Which brands do you consume from? The brands that reinforce visual biases or the ones that are going to challenge them? And that is how we start to make a difference. Because the most powerful stories throughout history have been the ones told with pictures. If we aspire to build a more inclusive society, then ultimately we need to challenge that visual narrative. Otherwise, we stand absolutely no chance of telling a new story. My story could have been different if they had chosen a different picture. I'll probably have got less hate or less death threat. But it made me even more passionate to work with my artists daily to shift perception and ultimately fight visual biases. I hope you can join me. Onwards. Thank you. Thank you.